ladies and gentlemen, we got a big interview lined up for you. Here is my managing editor Nikun Damia in conversation with uh, Nicholas uh, Nasim Talib, renowned author. He's of course written that famous book uh, Black Swan and Skin in the Game. Here's that conversation. Federal Reserve has lost one weapon: interest rates. Because at zero, you can't really go negative. There's no there's are arbitrages, but they have uh, the monetary policy arm uh, uh, is not just lowering rates. They can print money to buy your commercial paper. Okay, the commercial paper of a Maltese bank in New York, they buy it. Anything they see that's on sale, they buy. It. So that definitely will prop up the stock market for a while. But remember, okay, nothing is permanent. Okay. When they stop buying, or if they realize that what they're doing may be inflationary, okay, then things go back to normal. So the one thing I've learned as in the life of 37 years since I started trading, very counterintuitive, is that recessions are very good for stocks because the reaction to recessions makes stocks rally, and booms are very, 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 very bad. They make stocks very volatile because, of course, they've got to raise rates and people have substitutions into bonds. So this is one of the reasons why stocks are not collapsing. But if you are, if outside the stock market, okay, which, you know, uh, which is investor-led, you know, by, by people who just put money but not work, if you walk around, you see nothing but businesses closed. So you have entire sector that will not come back. So number one, rotation from sectors like real estate will do very poorly in, in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, office building, okay? And, in, and of course, in retail, of, uh, because people are buying now on Amazon, it will do poorly. Other industries doing well. And over time, the economy overall will adapt to that. Will, will adapt in the sense that I'm adapted. Look, I have, I'm a professor. I have a studio now in, in my uh, home where I have a blackboard, a lecture on a blackboard. I'm adapted. And, 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 and it's actually a lot cheaper for uh, universities or for conferences uh, to take place online. Okay, You don't have to fly people in. You don't have to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, clean the offices. You don't have to, uh, you know, provide food. Everything is everything's much more, and, and, and you're cutting down on commuting time for, for a lot of employees. So so I am adapted in that sense. And, and uh, I mean, I hope for the best, but if it doesn't happen, I am adapted. A lot of farmers also are adapting. So we have an adaptation period. It seems to me that in, within two or three months, we'll be so adapted to this that uh, some people will, will, will thrive and, and would even regret normalcy. But I don't think we will have normalcy for one, th one reason. Unless there's a miracle cure, and we know what happens with miracle cures. You have, you know, they make the front page of, uh, at a time it was, it was, there was a rule, if a cure makes the front page of Newsweek, it's not a cure. Right. That was uh, that was the rule in, in, in 30 years ago. So like interferon, oh, cure for all viruses. No. OK, so uh, the uh, if we have even if we have a cure, of course, people will wait for side effects, failures, maybe uh, a vaccine that doesn't uh, uh, really uh, uh, adapt to uh, new mutations of the virus. So if we even if we have the cure, people will still be paranoid. OK and will not gather in bars unless, I mean, we're talking about young people maybe, but, but, but reasonable people will not gather in bars, will not go to crowded places, will not get into crowded elevators, will not uh, go to crowded, if they have, if they have the chance. And, and it looks like they have the chance, you see. And even the restaurant business can adapt. Like I, I'm now in Atlanta as a refugee, but I have a place here and I'm enjoying it. And I've noticed that there are restaurants that are entirely outdoors. <laughs> And these can thrive in, a, in, in this new environment with a e proper distancing and ventilation. Okay. But of course, you can't do that in, in the middle of the winter in New York. So there'll be losers, permanent losers, even if we have a, a semi cure for the virus, an announcement for a cure. It would take a long time for people to really believe that, uh, that, uh, uh, that it's risk free to go to crowded places. India has so far managed to contain the virus. So on the medical front, the lockdown has been a success. But do you think in the medium term and the short term, this lockdown is going to cost Indian economy a lot? I think that uh, it's a false economy <laughs> again. 
it's a false economy. Maybe the money you've saved from a short lockdown, you see, when you have a short lockdown, you save money for later, okay, compared to think about New York, think about the United States. Because although even we don't have lockdown, there is a drop in economic activity and we're prolonging the effect of the disease. So I think that uh, India had a very reasonable policy. India, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, New Zealand, Australia, oh, these, 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 many countries had very reasonable policy. They acted early. They acted wisely. They acted according to precautionary principles. And they had a morally acceptable stance. And, and let me talk about, if you don't mind, about my moral stance, saying we're going to uh, sacrifice the elderly because you know what? We don't need them anymore is something that would not cross any mind outside Sweden or some countries, some, some rich countries. Okay. So, so uh, uh, what we call gerontocide, killing the old, the, uh, the elderly by saying this disease doesn't affect the young, which is actually bad reasoning because we know that disease also affects many young. Okay. And we don't know, as I said, the long-term effect, but seeing these stances, okay that uh, uh, they're morally not acceptable to many cultures and including the Indian culture where you have respect for the elderly. You see, they're not accepted by Mediterranean culture because for the Romans, senatus means the older person. <laughs> That's why they had the Senate. The Senate is the council of the elders, okay? So not only you wouldn't kill the elders, but they had a prominence and the Arabic word sheikh, what does it mean? It means older. So seniority in age was effectively social seniority, intellectual seniority, and political seniority. So what we're facing here is a divide that, that few are noticing between the two worlds. Okay, the world that has the ancient world imbued with ancient values, and a new world that succeeded economically over the past, say, 75 years. Okay. And, and now we're seeing that maybe their moral advancement is not there and, and that will, that's going to cost them. And even then, now Sweden, for, for um, our friends uh, here who uh, don't know the story, has decided to let the thing go. Okay, they say, okay, we'll burn through the population, we'll kill a few people, um, uh, we, uh, and then uh, the, the young will not be affected, which is turning out to be a very bad idea because many young are affected. We don't know if something they call herd immunity works. We don't have no idea. And what is worse is that their economy is not is also suffering. You see, this is the, the, the poetic justice is not only they're killing the old people, but their economy is also suffering. So this is why I mean, so, so sometimes people put you in front of the dilemma. Okay, this is the, this is a cost benefit analysis. And, and a lot of countries, including India, including, uh, uh, I mean, countries in, in the Southeast of Asia, countries in the Middle East and the Mediterranean would refuse that on moral grounds. Before I get into India's specific question and we start talking about risk, as a statistician, I'm sure you've studied viruses and the history. This virus has seen a winter and a summer, it has survived. Monsoon is about to come, it has only started in Japan and parts of China. Do you think the virus could uh, spread more? or it could be normal. Okay, we don't know. The, the, uh, the idea, you see, uh, the, the, uh, let's look at the reasoning of why we're talking about pseudo experts that we've discovered, uh, my friends and I, we study macro things, okay, macro properties. I, I just have a paper coming this week in, uh, uh, either this week, next week in uh, Nature Physics on what we call the fat tails of pandemics, which is effectively what drove me to write uh, that comment that you uh, nicely put in uh, in the Black Swan, I mean, the, the comment in Black Swan that I nicely mentioned, uh, that was driven by some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, anecdotal empiricism I did that we formalize now with nature physics. You look at the macro property, the systemic effect, not the, uh, you don't go from a micro to the macro, you go from macro properties to mac micro decision. So it, it turns out that people involved in uh, medicine were too myopic to understand that maybe it's not the thing you have. Whereas when you look at macro, you're much more skeptical about claims. So in the beginning, they thought it was like SARS. 
And on January 26, when, when we issued our warning, we said, maybe it's like SARS. Okay, we're all okay. Maybe it's not. Okay. So now there, is, there are a lot of things that maybe it's not. So uh, the claims were initially that don't worry about it. Wuhan, that was in January, has a harsh winter. Look at the, on TV all their hats and stuff. You know, therefore, uh, countries that are warm don't have that. And effectively, the influenza, okay, and people thought, oh, it's just another flu, maybe a little worse, uh, you know, but, but within the same category. So they had a category error. It, it, so they thought that viruses, okay, this class of viruses, for some reason, okay, do not like summers, either because more people are outside or maybe because the nature of the virus doesn't survive on surfaces, whatever. And then they had a lot of theories. And then we said, you can't, okay, because we still don't know enough to make these assumptions. <laughs> when you model, you had to look at the macro properties that are robust and common to all diseases. And the more you know, the more you can narrow it to the category and say, oh, less harmful than, but here we still don't know in the absence of information, okay? And we still have no information. We still do not know anything. About, I mean, people were not recommending masks till recently when in fact masks could have saved the US economy, <laughs> you see? So even the President Trump doesn't use masks, but they didn't realize that uh, from the beginning, okay, they thought that uh, like some other viruses, it was, it was transmitted by contact, not uh, via aerosol or droplets in the air. And it's turning out not to be true. Which, and my masks, are masks are incredibly effective, okay, for things that are respiratory because uh, of, of uh, you know, it's, it's, it's filter on both sides, okay, and compounding the filter works very well. After two or three person, you can pretty much lower the transmission. Anyway, so what I'm saying, so to summarize, it is, we cannot make assumptions of seasonality before seeing a lot of seasons, okay? So I would stay on a maximal alert. I would hope, you know, that, you know, uh, summers with, with, with high temperatures, humidity will, will harm it. But in the meanwhile, I would wait. Okay. Now, before I shift focus to risk and asset allocation, I'm going to just read off for everyone in the webinar. One quote of Mr. Talib, people have the problem of denial. This is one of the biggest things I have learned in the Lebanon. Everyone who left Beirut, when the war started, including my parents, said, oh, this will last two weeks. It lasted 17 years. I guess that is what he's trying to refer to this virus. Please don't be in a denial mode. Learn to live with reality that virus is here. Like he told us a couple of days ago, plague lasted for more than 200 years. So I'm going to just shift focus, uh, Mr. Talib, and talk about what should one do. You're a risk exactly. trader. Right? You are a trader. Yeah. Let's understand by where are you investing and how are you investing personally? Okay. Yes. In Skin in the Game, I said that I will not never uh, recommend anything that I don't have myself out of moral, for moral reason. That way, if my recommendation is wrong, I lose money. It's good. I have a good conscience. Um, I hate gold. I've always hated gold. Unfortunately, I own gold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I hate uh, European currency. Unfortunately, I own European, some European currencies. Uh, I like land. Okay, so I own land, uh, I own uh, olive trees. Uh, it's not economical for now, but I feel comfortable. Why? I feel it's a good repository of value. So what, now let me tell you what's driving my, my thing. Um, I have two fears, okay? One fear is of deflation and one fear of inflation. And I've learned through history that there's no such thing as inflation anymore. Okay, there's hyperinflation or nothing, okay? So now we are in a deflationary environment, okay? Uh, not for some things, okay? But typically, I mean, you can feel a deflation. Uh, it can switch very easily from because it's throwing so much money at it into something great. So I want to hedge to make sure my uh, my uh, funds, my my my, what, my savings, that they are unaffected by both deflation or hyperinflation. Okay, so I have a large portion and think that for paranoia, I am uh, making bets. Odds are I will lose on them, but they're usually protective bets against long-term bond rates. 
because I think that eventually, if they keep at some point, even the government of the United States, you see, if the Chinese stop buying bonds, okay, the Arabs stop buying bonds, even the government of the United States may not be able to issue bonds to pay for this, okay? So you, you cannot, and you cannot just have the Federal Reserve buy your bonds, okay? It becomes sort of so circular. So, uh, and I have, of course, what we call Taylor's Hedge. And I would like in uh, phase two and to invest in some businesses that are both robust to recovery from this and robust to the virus, you see? Some companies uh, may not be robust to the uh, to the recovery, like for example, delivery services. Okay, a lot of people uh, may not be. You know, th these are booming. And where I live, you have food delivered, stuff delivered. Uh, so Amazon may suffer a little. Okay, uh, if 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 you have normalcy, but there are some businesses where I think, like uh, what we're doing now, Zoom or some other, uh, they may gain because we've discovered a new way of doing business and a lot of employees would like to stay home independent of the virus simply because they find it more effective to not commute. Some people commute for three hours in, to New York City. So, so that is, so th there, there, there's some habits that would be permanent. So try to identify companies that are uh, robust to both the recovery and, the, and, and boom during the, the, the virus. And then, and as you said, I would hope that this will last two more weeks. But I will act as if it's going to be 17 years. So there's a difference between, between you know, what you hope and, and, uh, and, and how you act. If I increase the time frame, which is terminal, a lot of experts use that. Let's look at terminal investing. One year, five year, and 10 year. Would you still like to buy gold in every basket? Okay, so let me tell you one, one, one thing that I, uh, uh, one dogma I have. Uh, you should invest for tomorrow and you invest for 100 years in exactly the same way. And, and let me make an anecdote. Uh, the, the, the main difference between an investor, what's the difference between an investor and a trader? Well, a, a trader who loses money on his trade becomes an investor. <laughs> so I'm in it for a long term. If they make money, they get out. So you cannot divorce if you depend on what happens tomorrow. If you, you cannot say I invested for a hundred years, if you ever had to change allocation tomorrow based on new information, then you're investing for one day. So this, and, and this is, is a big thing. And, and actually it was, it was strangely enough in, in my first technical book published 23 years ago, Dynamic Edging, where you explain that it's a, what you call the Markov property, you see, that uh, you, you, there's no, uh, and effectively, uh, it's a wrong way uh, to approach problems. I want to invest for tomorrow, okay, but I treat the same, the same way. So, it, 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 and it's the same reasoning as saying, oh, um, uh, the, 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 you know, plane crash, uh, plane, we have plane crashes on average every 20 years, but I'm only going to travel for two days. You can't really, you know, there's a memoryless process. So this is how I treat it. But, so I would treat everything at both short term and long term. Okay. And I would say everybody should do that because if you invest in 20 for 20, say I'm investing for 20 years, if there's any reason for you to change allocation tomorrow, because you found something monstrously more attractive. Okay. You saw the great mansion, uh, someone's bankrupt selling it and you switch out into this, then you're effectively investing for 24 hours. You see, this is what I call uh, uh, the memoryless investing. Okay. 